All right. <clears throat> so we have sound. Excellent. We have sound here. Uh, excellent. <clears throat> all right. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, those that decide to join us on Facebook Live, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, folks that are joining us on Pal, Pal Talk, again, we also appreciate uh, you all for joining us as well. So a uh, couple things that I do want to mention real quick before we get started. Um, we're currently right now going through Matthew chapter 4 on Wednesday nights. Uh, that's what we're getting ready to deal with. So if you uh, want to go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 4, we'll get started on that shortly. Uh, second thing that I wanted to mention is Sundays, uh, we're going through a couple different series. One is weeding the tulip garden, uh, which what we're doing is taking the tulip of Calvinism and uh, making it useful. Uh, so we've got, we've already talked about the T is uh, total forgiveness and U is uh, unconditional love, which is where that total forgiveness comes from. And uh, so we're going to continue that series Sunday morning. Also after that Sunday mornings, uh, what we're doing is we're going through talking about the doctrine of suffering. Now that's one that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but um, that is one thing that a lot of folks are dealing with right now in some shape or form. So uh, we've got that going on. Also, um, if you're in the Frankfort, Kentucky area anytime soon, uh, preferably or especially uh, right around November 7th, yeah, um, <clears throat> we're, we're looking at uh, doing a, a full day uh, four sessions uh, talking about what's going on in the world. So uh, we'll, we'll get out some more information on that shortly, but that's something to think about. At least pencil it in on a calendar. So, all right. So Matthew chapter 4, uh, we're going to start off in verse 12 and read down through verse 17 and uh, then get started. All right. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Galilee or Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. As we uh, continue in this study of the book of Matthew, may we open our hearts and minds to what you're, what you're teaching us here, uh, not just uh, doctrinally, but dispensationally, that we can know and understand uh, what's going on at that particular time, um, specifically dealing with the nation of Israel. And as we go through and study this, may we um, allow your word to be the final authority in all things that we go back and we study these things to find out whether or not they be so, uh, that we're Bereans in our own personal Bible study, uh, that we can be fully persuaded of the things that are written in your scriptures. Uh, we thank you for this day, we thank you for your word, and we thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So, as we come down through in the book of Matthew, uh, we've gotten chapter 1, 2, 3, we've gone through those. Uh, we've dealt with the birth of Jesus Christ. We've dealt with the forerunner of Jesus Christ. We've dealt with the baptism of Jesus Christ and the fact that he is identifying himself with the believing remnant that's partaking in that baptism of John. Uh, and then in chapter 4, we start off ta talking about the temptation and how Satan was trying to get Jesus Christ to do things that he knew he was going to do. He tried to get Jesus Christ to do things at the wrong time. All right? So he knew that he was going to do certain things, but he was trying to get Jesus Christ to do them before he was supposed to. And that's one of the tactics that Satan deals with. One is he tries to destroy God's word. We looked at that in Genesis chapter 3. 
We've also looked at the fact that how um, what he does through religious systems is tries to deny what God's word actually says. And then, of course, we know and understand the dispensational facts and aspects of the scripture that God is doing certain things at certain times with a group of people, right? So the idea dispensation doesn't really have to do with a time period, um, but of course, obviously, because we have time, it's involved in it. Um, it's just a particular set of rules and instructions that God dispenses to a group of people. Well, it just so happens that in Matthew chapter 4, he starts dispensing some things to a particular group of people. What do we notice here in chapter 4 verse 12 says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. So where is it that Jesus Christ goes? He goes into Galilee. We looked at this the last time. You get over to chapter 19 verse 1 and he departs from Galilee. So we see from Matthew chapter 4 all the way to Matthew 19, we find out that this is his Galilean ministry. This is what he's doing at that particular time. And it's really fascinating because we talked about it the last time. Um, you know, there is some period of time from verse 11 to verse 12, right? Um, verse 11, uh, or actually I should say technically from the end of chapter 3, uh, Jesus Christ goes up shortly after uh, being baptized, coming up out of the water. He goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And then what happens is, is he comes out and he finds out that John's where? In prison. And so when Jesus had heard that John was, in, was cast into prison, what's he do? He departs into Galilee. So that's where he goes. Um, and what we're going to find out is there is a reason why he goes. Um, Obviously, the main reason is you look at verse 14. Why is it that he goes? Verse 14, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. And then what he does is he quotes Isaiah chapter 9. And so one of the reasons, and this just goes to the fact of, you know, we, we've, we've taken a look at while Christ was going through the temptation, what was his ultimate what was it that he ultimately relied on was god's word right we talked about that we went through that because what it hit what was his response to satan every time it is written it is written it is written how often do we go through scripture and we find out that jesus christ you know we talked about it before he's on the cross right and he knows that there's a verse that needs to be fulfilled and he says what i thirst because he knows that there's a verse that needs to be fulfilled. There's, there's an issue with, with the life of Jesus Christ is completely and totally dependent upon God's word. And we see that is one of the reasons why he goes into Galilee is because that it might be fulfilled. All right? And, you know, you take a look at some, some things throughout time. And, um, you know, I've, I've often thought about, let's, let's talk about the, the mathematics behind the proof that that uh, this book, this Bible, uh, was written by God. Now he used human authors to do it, but God actually wrote this book. And one of the ways that you can prove that, and one of the ways that you can prove God exists, one of the ways that you can prove um, is through the mathematical statistical probability of Jesus Christ fulfilling uh, prophecy. So the, the, the statistical probability of fulfilled prophecy. Now, some people will sit back and say, yeah, but look at verse 14. It says the reason he did it was that he would fulfill the verses so that he'd fulfill the scripture. All right, but did he choose to be born <laughs> at a certain place? No. And so, you know, there's all kinds of other things, but here's the issue that we really see here in verse 14 is the reason that he goes is because he is completely and totally reliant upon God's word. And he knows that there are things in God's word that have to come to pass. And that's one of the reasons. The ultimate reason as we go down through here is what he's going to start doing is he's going to start setting up his governmental 
structure. So real quick, go over to Matthew chapter 21. Um, because there's a few things that, uh, you know, keep it in mind some of the things that we, we already know or should know. Uh, we've already talked about some of these issues. Um, but get, get uh, Matthew chapter 2 in one hand and get Luke chapter 12 in the other. Um, so Matthew 21, Luke chapter 12. Um, and then with your other hand, let's get Luke 22. All right, so we've got Matthew 21, Luke 12, and Luke 22. Um, we'll look at some other things as well, but we'll start off here. <clears throat> Luke chapter 21, or Matthew chapter 21. Um, notice, notice, we'll start off, Jesus Christ in verse 33 gives a parable of a householder demanding the fruit from his vineyard, right? Uh, if you look at verse 33, it says, Here another parable, there was a certain householder, which in the context here, first of all, one of the things is, you know, parables aren't stories, right? Growing up, one of the things that I was told is, well, parables are just stories that Jesus used to try to get his point across. No, really, parables were actually a, a what? It was, it, was a, it, was, it was a rebuke against unbelieving Israel. <laughs> it's what it was. So he was teaching things that they should have known, and the fact that they didn't was a rebuke against them. Um, and so that's what he's doing here. But notice, here another parable. There was a certain householder, and of course that householder is God, which planted a vineyard uh, and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen. Now, there's a whole bunch of things here that we can take a look at um, that we just don't have time for. Um, but you go back in Scripture, in the Old Testament, and search some of those things out and get an idea of what he's talking about when he's talking about a vineyard. Um, you know, the vine in the Scripture, that dealing with that national life, uh, you've got that there's a, a, that he's hedged it round about. So one of the things that God did with the nation of Israel is what? I'm going to set you apart from the rest of the world, from the rest of the nations. And he digged a wine press in it and built a tower. And, and, you know, you go through and you look at all those things. You go back in Old Testament and you can find out some of those things. That's not the issue now. Uh, otherwise, maybe we just need to talk about that sometime. Um, but keep on going. So a householder plants a vineyard, verse 34, or at the end of verse 33, and went into a far country. Verse 34, and when the time, and when the time of fruit drew near. So you think about that. There's a time element to it. And we've, we've talked about this before in the very last verse that we read in chapter 4, verse 17. What's it say? From that time began Jesus to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's time and elements with this. That's why I say, you know, a dispensation is not a period of time, but time is involved. And there came a time, and then when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman that he might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman uh, took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. And again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. So what he's telling the nation of Israel is saying, God has given you all opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to what? Produce fruit. And when he sends his servants... What happens? The husband took his servants and killed them. And then he says, well, I'm going to send the son. Well, who's the son here in the parable? Of course, that's Jesus Christ. So he sends Christ to go and, 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 and look for the fruit from this, from this vineyard. 
Why? Because the time of the fruit drew near. There was a time when there was supposed to be fruit. One of the things that, you know, we know, hopefully, you know, if you've ever planted a garden, there are some rules that you have in gardens. One is whatever you plant, you're going to reap, right? You reap what you sow. Paul tells us that. You reap what you sow. And so what happens is, is when you go plant, for instance, corn. When I grew up, one of the things we do is we had rows and rows of corn. I really love corn, especially fried corn crumpled up with some bacon in it. Mm. Kind of makes me hungry. But you've got rows and rows of corn. We, pl we planted potatoes. We planted beans. We had peas. We had all kinds of things that we would plant. And when we planted corn, we didn't expect tomatoes to come out of it, right? So what happens is, is whatever you plant, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. The next thing is, is whatever you plant, you're going to reap later, right? And so not only that, but whatever you sow, you're going to reap more of. So, you know, you go, you go plant a row of corn. You're going to get a whole bunch of corn. You save some of those. You can plant two rows the next year. So you get a whole bunch of corn. You can plant more. Uh, years ago, Delilah and I had gone to um, Monticello, right? We went to Monticello with uh, George Washington, obviously not with him, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and then we also went to uh, Mount Vernon. And in Mount Vernon with George Washington, obviously not with him, but, you know, that's where he lived. One of the things that he said is there's no reason for you to buy seeds ever again once you start planting something. Because you know that you should hold back some so you can plant for the next year. <clears throat> there's a little gardening tip for you. But the issue there is what? Whatever you plant, you're going to reap. You're going to reap later, and you're going to reap more than what you sowed. So what, is, what happens here is God plants. He plants a vineyard. What should he get? Whatever he planted. And so when the time drew near for the fruit, and he goes to get the fruit, he finds none. And so what is it? What is it that you do when your boss tells you to do something and you don't do it? Well, well, you know, I'm working on it and I promise I'll get it to you tomorrow. You don't let him see that you've actually not started. You know, that's one of the things with kids at school that I've learned over and over again. And it's even, it's exacerbated right now. The ability for a child to put things off is even more so on display now than it even was last year in school because of the way that we're doing things. I have kids that are emailing me saying, why don't you have my grade in? Well, you didn't turn it in. Yeah, I did. Three weeks late you did. Well, you should just go ahead and grade it. And I'm like, you don't understand how that works. So what happens when you show up and your boss says, hey, I need that thing. Well, I don't have it. What's, what's going to happen to you if you try to hide it? And that's what these guys were doing. God sent his servants, and what were, they were there to check the fruit. And what they do? They killed them. And then God sends the son. And what do they do to the son? They say, hey, here's the son. Let's kill him. If we get rid of him, then we're going to get his inheritance. And that's what the nation of Israel does over and over again. Every time God sent somebody to them. But as we continue on here, notice, drop down to, uh, well, let's keep on going, verse 39. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vine yard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? And so what he's doing is point blank telling the, the religious folks here, what? What are you going to do when God comes? Verse 40, notice, or verse 41. They said unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Do you know what they've just done? They've actually 
told Jesus Christ exactly what God's going to do. Notice, verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures? Again, what is his basis of everything that he does is what? The Word. Have you not read the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, husbandmen that God let out his vineyard to, and I'm going to do what? Give it to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Do you know what he's doing? He's saying, you guys are right, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the kingdom from you, and I'm going to go give it to somebody that you don't think is a real nation. By the way, that is not you and I today in the United States of America. You, America is not God's chosen nation. Um, you know, I, I even feel remiss bringing this up, but I will. I watched a little bit of the debate last night. Charles Darwin years ago said, you have, you have with evolution, things are going to get better, better, and better. You compare last night's presidential debate to one 60 years ago, And tell me we're getting better and better. What you see before your very eyes is the actual degeneration of man. And we're shocked that this is the best that we can come up with is the United States of America. You know why you're shocked? Because you think things are going to get better. Things will constantly get worse and worse and worse. Paul tells us that, especially as the day comes, draws nearer. Men are going to wax worse and worse. So you think last night was bad. Wait 12 years. <laughs> uh, wait 16 years. That's as political as I'm going to get. Let's go. <clears throat> Verse 44, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder. Notice here. Here's where they get it, verse 45. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived <laughs> that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. You know why? Because he was. Jesus Christ is one day going to be the prophet, priest, and king for the nation of Israel. You know why? We talked about this before. The three gifts that he was given was for the prophet, priest, and king. And so you think about those things. So what happens is there's this stone that's going to come. You go back to Daniel chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, and you study those things out and you see those things. But here's this nation. Uh, go over to Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> also, I know I didn't say this earlier, but get Romans chapter 11. Luke chapter 12. And Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> or Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. So Luke chapter 12. And Romans, Romans chapter 10. Notice in Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> Start off in verse. Start off in verse twenty-four. Consider the ravens. Most people know these verses, so this isn't anything that should be new to us, right? Verse twenty-four. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with uh, with with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? Can you make yourself shorter or taller? No. But notice, if ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you, that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God uh, so clothe the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not, 
ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. Neither be ye doubtful of doubtful mind. So what he's doing is he's setting them up for something that's going to happen to them in the future. But here's the best part. Verse 30. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. I would skip verse 29, didn't I? That's all right. Verse 29. And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, but uh, neither be ye of doubtful mind. I did say that. Verse 30. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather... Don't seek those things because God's going to take care of you in that issue because one of the things that they're going to do, and you go down through here and you start reading in verse 42 and go down and you see a parable about some people that are going to go through the tribulation period, by the way, which is not you and I. Luke chapter 12 is not about you and I today. Luke chapter 12 was talking to those believers at that time, the believing remnant, and you'll see that who that is in a minute. Um, but because of the way that God's changed the dispensations and He's inserted into the scriptural timeline what we call or what God calls the dispensation of the grace of God, we know that there's going to be a group of people out there that's going to be prepared to go through that tribulation period. And in starting off in verse 42 through 48 of Luke chapter 12 here, you've got a parable dealing with the prepared believer, the unbeliever, and the unprepared believer. And you take a look at those things, study that out for yourself sometime. But what Christ is doing there is he's trying to tell them, pay attention guys. Don't go searching for all that stuff because your father knows what you need. And here's the best part, verse 31. But rather, don't seek those things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God. Now, in Matthew, we talked about this before. I don't have my board up here, so I'll point and you all know what I'm talking about, right? When we talked about it, there were two things that we talked about at the very beginning. One is Matthew presents Jesus Christ as king. And the question that we always had was, where is the king? And one of the other topics that we talked about and said remind our, or keep ourselves in our mind is he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Now, what's the kingdom of heaven? We talked about that. It's the kingdom that the, that the God of heaven is going to bring down here on the earth one day. And so what Jesus Christ is telling the believers here is, rather, don't seek those things, but seek ye the kingdom of God. And guess what? All these things are going to be added unto you. By the way, that is not a promise for us today. I don't care what Kenneth Copeland, uh, Kenneth Hagen, uh, Jesse Duplantis, all those Word of Faith guys, uh, Pastor Durbin right down the street here. That verse isn't for us today. What he's saying is to those people there and those folks that are going to be after the dispensation of grace, he says, seek those things that have to do with the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. Verse 32, fear not. Here's their title, little flock. Why? Why should they not fear? For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So when you look at that and you go back to Matthew uh, in Matthew chapter 21 where he says, I'm going to take the kingdom from you and give it to no people a foolish nation right that's the little flock here what are they going to do verse 33 sell that ye have and give alms provide yourselves bags which wax not old a, tre a treasure in the heavens that faileth not whether no where where no thief approacheth neither neither moth corrupteth for where your treasure is there will your heart be also do you know what he says to prepare them for not going to seek those things sell everything you have because God's going to take care of you that will be a literal promise that will be fulfilled during that tribulation period for those believers at that time that is not a verse to you and I today to go and sell everything that we have there are people today who write books 
and they say, well, this is a radical faith. We're just going to be radical and follow God, and we're going to sell everything that we have. Uh, well, you will. I won't because, you know, I've got, I've got a couple million dollar homes and boats and cars, but you all don't need to know about that. You need to sell your stuff and give me your money. And that's what they do. They do it all the time. Why do you think, I mean, honestly, why do you think that Joel Osteen and, and Kenneth Copeland and all those other guys, why do you think that they have compounds that's worth millions and millions of dollars? Our, our cat gets it. Perfect timing. It's been a while since she's been here. But here's the thing. What's going to happen is, is God's going to take care of them. And he says, I want you to make sure to know, sell what you have, give alms, provide for yourselves. Don't provide anything for you because I'm going to take care of you. Little flock. Um, go over to Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10. Moses told the nation of Israel that this was going to happen. Romans chapter 10, verse 19. But I say, did not Israel know? It's a really good question. Had they read the scriptures? You know, one of the things that a lot of folks don't really pay attention to is where is it that knowledge comes from? Knowledge comes from God's Word. You have to know God's Word in order, and, and you know, we've said this before, <clears throat> your life cannot, she's on that, no, I don't. Your life, I think it's fine, it just kind of moved a little bit. Your life cannot work apart from knowing and understanding God's Word, especially God's Word rightly divided. It won't work. And so then, did not Israel know? It's a good question. First, Moses saith, what's he telling them? When Paul's writing this and he's telling us about uh, the nation of Israel in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, he's talking about the dispensational aspect of what's going on today in the dispensation of grace and how God's set aside that program that he started um, back in Genesis with Abraham. When we go back to there, what's he say? First, Moses saith, where is it that he takes them to? How, how should Israel know? Go read the scripture. First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. So what is he talking about there? You go back to Deuteronomy and you take a look at that. And he's talking about the, the nation that little flock that we see there, a no people. As they talk about, we talked about it the last time, they thought of, they didn't even think of the folks in Galilee as a part of the nation of Israel. We go over here to Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> Luke chapter 22. What do we have? We'll take a look at this. <clears throat> Luke chapter 22. Notice in verse, we'll just start off in verse 28. Luke chapter 22, verse 28. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a what? A kingdom. As my Father hath appointed unto me that ye may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. We go over to Matthew chapter 19. He tells them what? That they're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. They're going to have 12 gates. They're going to have their own place for the nation of Israel. Those 12 that Jesus Christ calls out in Matthew chapter 10, he says, I'm going to give you governmental authority in that kingdom. And what are they going to do? Sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's really interesting. <clears throat> um, go real quick to... I'm telling you, this time goes by way too quickly. Uh, go back to Isaiah real quick. <clears throat> go back to Isaiah. 
Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. Some really interesting things as we go down through here. But I want us to I want us to see I want us to see some things. Remember Isaiah chapter eight. Remember chapter nine is where 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 Jesus Christ says this this verse needs to be fulfilled. So he goes to Galilee. I want, because I want you to think about this: of the twelve that Jesus Christ originally chose, eleven of them were from Galilee. We'll see that. The group of people that the nation of Israel did not consider part of the nation of Israel, which is what we laid, laid out last week. There's only one that wasn't part of Galilee. And oddly enough, he was the one that turned Christ in for 30 pieces of silver. But what, God, what Christ does is in, in, in Matthew chapter 4 is he turns his attention because John's in, in prison and he turns his attention to Galilee and he goes and starts working on his Galilean ministry. And what's he do? We're going to find that out here in a little bit. But notice Isaiah chapter 8. <clears throat> um, start off in verse, start off in verse uh, 18. <clears throat> Verse 17, And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to his word, it is because there is no light in them. So I want you to remember, what is it that they're doing? Remember, Christ, when he goes up to Galilee, and we see this down in chapter 9, verse 1, where he's talking about the, or verse 2, when he's talking about the darkness and the shadow. What are these people doing? They're not, they're not speaking according to his word. It is because there is no light in them. Keep on going, verse 21, and they shall pass through it hardly uh, bestead, or best, uh, bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness and of anguish. And they shall be driven to darkness. So, when Christ shows up after his baptism, he goes to Galilee. Why? So that it might be fulfilled. Notice right here, chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. We talked about that phrase, Galilee in the nations of the nations. Israel did not think of Galilee as part of the nation of Israel. They thought of them as just as, just, just as bad as those Gentiles out there. Verse 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Do you know what happens? You've got, you've got this darkness out there. And God's going to go out there. Jesus Christ is going to go out there. Notice, drop down... <clears throat> Drop down to verse, uh, verse 6. And everybody knows this verse, right? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And notice, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Notice, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth 
even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Do you know what he's talking about? There's going to come a time where Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to set up that kingdom. And what's going to happen to that? There's going to be an increase of his government. No end to it. And that's, that's that second coming. That's what they're looking forward to. But we see the first part here is, is, is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 4 where he says, I'm going to go up to Galilee. Um, he says, I'm going to go get a whole bunch of what you all consider nobodies. Go over to Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> You know, a lot of times, it's very, it's very fascinating because you can even take that and make an application today. Um, <clears throat> where is it that you normally find people doing the work of the Lord? Oh, you're talking about that bunch of nobodies down there where nobody ever goes? You should come, you should come to our church. We, we have two services every morning. We got thousands of people each in each one. We've got a, an old-fashioned hymn service, but we also have uh, the new contemporary service. You can pick whatever you want. Just come down and be part of what God's really doing. And you can see because look at all the people that we have. Look at all the programs that we have. Look at all the things. Look at where we have our hand in every cookie jar throughout the world. And you're going to go to that nobody down there? How often does God use those who are thought of as not a person, no nation, a foolish nation as they called them? Notice here, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Notice, who is it that he gets? He's up in Galilee. And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were what? The greatest theologians that he could come across. They knew every bit of scripture. No, they were fishers. He goes down on the Sea of Galilee and he finds a couple of fishermen and says, What? Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Here's, here's the fascinating part. Verse 20, And they straight way left their nets and followed him. Now how many people today, you see this guy walking up next to you and he comes and says, hey, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. How many, how many of you all think, well, there's two of us, one of him. Let's just, let's just take care of this real quick. What did they do? They left their nets and followed him. Keep on going. <clears throat> Drop down to verse, or keep on going, verse 21. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and they immediately left the ship. They didn't wait. They didn't ponder it. They said, well, you know, we should probably go. To... No, immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Keep on going. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And you go down through there and there's some fascinating things. Um, go over to John chapter 1. <clears throat> John chapter 1. <clears throat> We won't get all of these guys, but we'll get us a whole bunch of them here. <clears throat> John chapter 1, verse... Start off here in verse 35. <clears throat> Notice. Again, the next day after John... Uh, after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What, why, what seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, 
which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. All right, so now we've got Andrew here, which we've already talked about in chapter 4, verse 18. Keep on going. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, uh, beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is, a, and by, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth who? Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Beth Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Do you know what? You could almost, in my mind, as I'm reading through this, and I was looking at this last week and, and studying through these things and look at this, it's almost as if you, you've got this uh, high school reunion type thing, right? Um, you've got Philip shows up, says, Oh, Andrew, Peter, how are you all doing? Uh, but they were in the same place. They grew up in the same place with them. Notice, <clears throat> verse, verse 45 Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So what do we see here? We get on through. We find out that Philip's there. Where's Philip from? Philip's from the same place as Andrew and Simon. So he's, he's getting him a whole bunch of Galileans. People that the nation of Israel said, We don't... We don't even recognize you all as part of what we're doing. Go over to Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Uh, notice here in verse 1. <clears throat> And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought him to a man sick of the palsy, lying on the bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto him, uh, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Um, drop down to verse Drop down to verse 8. Notice, But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Verse 9, And Jesus, and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. So you think about, you go down through here, where is he getting all these guys from? Galilee. He's going up and he's finding people that the nation of Israel thought of as, as a no people. He's going out and he's getting all these guys. Go real quick. Um, we got time for this. Uh, go get Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26. Um, and also get Acts chapter 2. Matthew 26. Uh, Matthew chapter 26. Uh, let's let's start off here in verse uh, verse 69. So Matthew 26:69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying. Thou also went with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that, that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I did not take, I did not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them. Notice, for thy speech bereath thee. Now 
Do you know what? We know who you are because of the way you've said stuff. The, 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 the you know, <clears throat> you, can, you can tell the difference between a northern Kentucky person and a southern Kentucky person. I, I've, I've listened to some old, old tapes that I did uh, 20 something years ago. And I listened to it and I'm thinking, man, you could tell I lived in southern Kentucky. Um, so I've, I've had people at conferences, uh, they'll introduce me and they'll say, you know, Brother Greg's from, from Kentucky, so uh, we've been invited them to come up and speak. And then I've had people come up to me afterwards and says, you're not from Kentucky based on the way you talk. And so then that's what, he, well, that's what they're saying. Peter, we know. They didn't know his name, but they said, we know that you're part of it because your speech betrayeth thee. Now, I didn't mispronounce that earlier. It did say ber bereath. Um, that's just, to me, I think that's beautiful. You look at that, bereath thee. So you think about that stuff. Go over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. So you've got Peter there saying, I was not with him. And they say, yeah, you were because the, what your, the, your, your, <coughs> your speech, what you're saying, your accent tells us that you're from Galilee. You're one of those Galileans. Notice here in Acts chapter 2, verse 5, day of Pentecost. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when, they, now when this was noised abroad, so what they're talking about there is the fact that the, the, the men there were, when the, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place in one accord, and the Holy Spirit comes down and they begin to speak in other tongues. And it's not the little hostile Shonda type stuff. It's not the whole blah, 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 and all that junk. They were literally talking in languages that they had no idea how to speak. And the way you know that is you read the verse and you find out when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Notice it doesn't say they were confused. It says they were confounded. Why? Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Do you know what you had? You had guys that were able to supernaturally speak in a different language. That's as if today, if somebody goes to another country to preach, they don't have to have an interpreter stand next to them. They would be able to go supernaturally and preach in that language of the country in which they go. That's what would be taking place if God was still doing that today. He's not, which is why you have to have an interpreter do that for you. But notice in verse 7. Not only were those folks confounded because they were able to hear them in their own language, but verse 7, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? What do we find out about that? They're all Galileans. And they say, Aren't these Galileans and they're speaking in my language? First of all, we talked about it the last time. They didn't think of them that way. They're like, there's no way that they could know some things because they're just ignorant Galileans. And they're amazed and they're, they marvel and they're confounded because they're hearing these guys speak in a language that those guys did not know. But they were able to hear them in their own language. Now, you've got... A couple different ideas on either side of the aisle. Some people say, well, God supernaturally gave those men the ability to speak. And then you've got other people say, well, God gave these people the supernatural ability to hear. You know, that's, that's neither here nor there. That's, that does away with the whole speaking in tongues. So you can, you can do with it what you want to from there. But here's the issue. What does Jesus Christ do? He goes up to Galilee and gathers a little flock, a foolish nation, a believing remnant, and he says, I'm going to give the kingdom to you all. And he starts gathering all those guys in Galilee. And it's really fascinating because as you go down through there, you're thinking, that's some good stuff. Because that's what God was doing at that time.
and what Jesus Christ was doing, there was a reason, not just to fulfill the verse, but there was a reason that he was going up there because it was prophesied by Moses that the nation of Israel would be made jealous by a foolish, no-person nation. People that they thought were lower than them that wasn't even part of their group. And God used them to make them jealous. And then what happens? Matthew chapter 4 verse 17, Jesus starts preaching. And that's where we'll pick up next time. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17, we'll continue on with that. Um, it, <laughs> You know, you go through these things, and you're like, man, this is, only God could write this Bible. To have that many authors, to have one coherent message um, is amazing. And then, of course, you got that Paul guy with his new information, which is also fantastic, but uh, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight on Facebook Live and also on Pal Talk. I greatly appreciate you all giving up an hour of your life uh, to be a part of what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> I would be remiss if I didn't make this offer to you. On Facebook, we do have it. Um, Delilah posted it up earlier. That if you want to be a part of the ministry, we we uh, we give you that opportunity to do that. Um, we're not asking or begging for money or anything like that but if you want to be a part of 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 what this ministry is doing um, we give that opportunity to you uh, if you don't want to don't feel like you have to if you want to and you can do it if you want to and you can't don't worry about it just send us a message say we're praying for you um, so thank you all for watching tonight Yeah. Oh, um, it's just me and Ari. So our, our other guy left. I must have ran him off. So uh, no, you're fine. <clears throat> uh, so uh, again, thank you all again. And uh, we'll see you Sunday morning. And then we'll see you all back again next Wednesday night. So uh, praise the Lord. Grace and peace. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. We're grateful that you've preserved it throughout the years that we can have it that we can handle it that we can read it that we can study it and as we take a look at these things as christ begins his earthly ministry um may we keep in mind what's going on there and the significance of it at that time and even though some folks at that time were actually looking for a literal visible physical earthly davidic kingdom Jesus Christ knows that that's something that's going to come later on. And he's mindful of what the verses actually teach. And he allowed that scripture to be the thing that, that he relied on daily as his own food. May we also do the same. That we might be the praise and honor and glory of your grace. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>